Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Bronwyn Zandi, and maybe by my accent you can tell I'm Australian. Um, I speak a few languages, um, Australian and Australian. So please, uh, if you know anything about Australians, we use a lot of slang, and sometimes I slip up. So in the presentation, if I say words or phrases that make no sense to you, please put your hand up and shout out. Um, because I, even people that have known me for 20 years, I teach them new phrases every time I talk to them. So I'm pretty excited to be here. Um, today I'm going to talk to you about building uh, better systems, boosting accessibility using default node network. Now that's a pretty long title, and I wanted to unpack it a bit in a few pieces. So the first one is, what is better? When I think of better, I don't think about the latest frameworks. I don't think about which stack I should be using. I don't think about, can I get that extra millisecond out of my SQL performance? I was talking to a 15-year-old girl a few weeks ago, and she was asking me what I did for you know my day job. Uh, and I, I was talking away to her, and we talked for a little while about what I do as a software developer. And then we sort of got around to how long I'd been doing that for. And she sort of was a bit taken aback when she realized that I'd been doing this for longer than she'd been alive. Made me feel a bit old as well. Um, so then she asked me, how can I possibly do the same thing for so long? Uh, I reflected on that a little bit. I resisted the temptation to, for the obvious things like, I need to eat, I need to pay my bills, uh, I have a mortgage, all those grown up things. And then I thought about it a little bit more. And what it came down to is that when I build software, I make people's lives better. Have any of you ever had an email from a user after you've released a piece of software or a system, and they send you this amazing email about what a difference you've made to their day? What a difference you've made to their life, their process, made something simpler for them, cut hours out of their day. Anyone? Couple? And is, that is a pretty rewarding feeling, yeah? And I think we really should do that a lot more. When I thought about it a little bit more and reflected on what building better software is, I came back with three principles to me that really resonated with what building something better was. First one, software should help me connect with people. As human beings, we're very sociable. We like to chat, we like to communicate, we like to express ourselves in different ways. Software should help me do that. The second principle, software should help me feel good about myself. Just as a kid jumping in that puddle, you just feel great. When you use software, you should feel good. When you use software, you may have heard people say things like, this is too hard. This system, you know, I'm just too silly. I, I don't understand it. It's too hard for me. Or they try to use it and put it away. Anyone of, any one of you that have heard any of your users do that, you might have missed part of this principle. Software isn't about making people feel bad about themselves. They should feel good. And the third one is, software should be personal and smart enough to understand me. If anyone has watched a user struggle to enter something onto a form or enter data in and go, oh, like, that's what I meant. The silly system, like, it should have known that's what I meant and that they think that they are not enough and that they are missing something. It means that you've missed something about them. So I want to keep those few principles in our mind as we go through some of the examples today. To move on to the next part of the, the title, I, wanted, I thought the best way to demonstrate it was to do a bit of an example. So what I'm going to do next is I'm going to show you a series of six different numbers. And what I'm going to get you to do is imagine entering them however you would like. 
you might want to tap them in the air or just think about it in your head. Or if you need something more tactile, you've got some of you have got a table in front of you or you've got your lap. But just think about, as I show you these numbers, what your brain thinks and how you would, how you would enter them, get that data entered. Does that make sense to everyone? Yep, a few nods. Okay, <laughs> let's give it a go. So the first one. Everyone thinking about how they would enter that number? Okay, let's try another one. We're getting a bit of a rhythm. And the fourth one? Now something a little bit different. Everyone got that one in? And then for the final one. So now that we think about the different ways that you had to go at using the numbers, did anyone mix them up a bit? Anyone use the same thing the whole way through? Tried a few. So when we think about them, did anyone think about using the traditional sort of fewer number pad layout? Quite a few, yeah. Did anyone switch to a slightly different one and go to a calculator? One, yeah. Anyone think about using the mobile phone number layout? Yeah. And anyone just use a standard keyboard number layout? Yeah. Did anyone use something different? No one, anyone try to think about using their voice? Yeah, what did you use? Can you say that again? Pen and paper. Yeah? <laughs> awesome. So some people had different ideas for the same, same display. So if we look back at these numbers, if you think back through using them, 420, 211, 113, uh, 131, 113, Anyone at this point sort of got in a bit of a groove and their fingers were doing the same thing over and over again? Some nods. And when we got down to the second last one, did anyone at that point switch? Yeah, a couple. And did anyone think about it? And like their brain went, oh, hang on, and had to think twice about where to put their fingers? A couple. And then for the last one, once it sort of started to look a bit more like a maths problem, did anyone change again? Couple. Cool. So for the first four, when you started to get into a little bit of a groove, uh, you probably were experiencing something called using your default mode network. So the default mode network is a set of regions in the brain that are spontaneously are active during passive moments. So looking at those diagrams there, the bits in the blue, the middle one, which isn't showing up super well, and the purple on the right. You may have experienced this in a few different ways. Uh, has anyone ever driven somewhere and got to a destination and not really remembered much of the journey? Or you're driving to your house and you were supposed to drop in at the shops on the way home and get the milk. You get, you get home and you went, sorry, honey, I forgot to go to the shop. So I was sort of a bit on autopilot. Or if you're like me and if you've been working at home recently, sometimes you know, I magically find myself in the fridge in front of the food and I don't remember going from my desk out to the fridge. Or I've left the house and can't remember if I turned that um, toaster off or closed the garage door. A lot of the time you might be using your default mode network. And then when 
you switched and you saw those numbers and it made you think about it, you've switched to the active part of your brain, which is like quite intense. So if anyone's ever done a lot of learning, uh, trying to learn something new, you can get quite tired because you, you're using a lot of, lots and lots of parts of your brain that make you, uses a lot of energy. So I've kind of been aware of this concept of a default mode network or muscle memory since I was quite young. Uh, but in recent years, it became a lot more apparent to me with this gentleman. This gentleman here, his name is Pat. He is a retired cartographer. He also studied uh, mining engineering, so that involves quite a bit of mathematics. Uh, full disclosure, he's my dad. So he has a condition called frontotemporal dementia, and that's a degenerative brain disease. So what happened for him, if you aren't aware of what the condition is, is it presented as he started to use, lose his language ability. So he, he would mix up words. He would start to be able to not to read. He'd like sound like a six-year-old sending out words and eventually couldn't read at all. So even though he got to the point where he could barely pick out a couple of words on a page, he had quite an active day. So he would wake up. He would pop out to the lounge room. He would come over. He would switch on the computer at the wall because he's from the generation where you've got to turn everything off at the wall all the time. He would come over to the laptop, press on the power button, open the lid, type in his pin code. He would open up his superannuation site. He would log in. He would write down a bunch of the information off the screen onto a, pen, on, onto a piece of paper, even though he couldn't read it back later. He would go over and look at the, the weather site and he couldn't really read it anymore, but he would recognize the symbol. So it'd be like sunny and he'd go for rain. And he could use the computer for most of the day. What was interesting was his computer was pretty old and it was getting slow. So I gave him my old one, you know, installed everything exactly the same, left it with them, rang my mum a week later and said, how's it all going? She's like, he, he can't use it. I went, Oh, what do you mean? Like, he's not using them? He's like, no, no, he keeps using the old one. He won't use the new one. And I was a bit perplexed. So I went over and, and just watched. So with the new one, he would get up. He would come out. He would switch the power on at the wall. He would open the laptop. He would look down for a little bit. No. Shut the lid. Then he would go and do the same thing with the original laptop. And he was fine. Strange. So when I had a, I, I looked at this for a little while. And here are the two computers side by side. The one on the left is the newer one. It's, um, it's a much newer 15 inch Dell. The one on the right is his old one. The difference between the two uh, laptops turned out to be that the power button is on the left hand side on his old one and on the right hand side on his new one. Now no matter what I did, I could not get him to relearn that. He would not, he could just not do it. He would just get stuck every single time. So that was okay, he went back to using the old one. Um, then eventually one of the websites that he used, they had a rebrand and they changed their logo a little bit. and. Mum rang up and said, oh, the app's just not working anymore. He can't get in. Came over, observed again, and he was just confused because suddenly things were different. Fortunately, and I think the reason was it was in exactly the same position on his desktop. He was able to relearn that that icon was the th same thing he wanted to get into. That he could do. Time went on. And the superannuation company was bought out and they had a complete new website. This was too hard for him. It was a different way to log in. The graphs that he was used to were no longer in the same position. So that part of his day was lost forever. And this continued on until eventually he couldn't use the computer anymore. A combination of things changing and his condition getting worse. So. This is a pretty big outlier and it's kind of a not fun story. So why do I feel like this is interesting to you? Um, is that when I thought about it, 
it's the same as me, except I don't have the degenerative brain disease yet. So this is, I have two laptops, <laughs> being a nerd, bit of a nerd. Um, so the, I have two laptops. My daily one is uh, the one on the right high end side. So this is this laptop here. Uh, it's a little Dell. And then the one on the left, that's, I have a little Surface laptop. It's pretty much what I call my lay in bed and watch Netflix laptop. So what I find really annoying about these two laptops is the uh, top hand right buttons there, the delete button and the power button uh, inversed on both laptops. So I wake up, I get my, like, jump on, look at the news. I'm all good. I go downstairs, jump on that laptop in my default network mode. Every single time I press the wrong button and the screen goes off instead of pressing delete. So I have to think about it and I have to remember which laptop it is and like which way the button's around. I, after a little while, I'm all good. Get to the end of the day, done, go back upstairs, sitting around watching Netflix. Oh, you know, want to want to check out what, what that thing they're talking about is. Jump on the other laptop, do the same thing again, over and over. Now, a lot of us, does anyone do hardware design? No one, yeah. So most of us don't do hardware design. Um, but as software engineers, this is still a valid principle. Because what we're looking at here is inclusive design. So if we can solve a problem for an outlier case, so fixing for one, we can fix for many. So I have a few stats on some of the next examples. Uh, they're all Australian based uh, and I couldn't find a perfect example for all the different combinations of people that would be here today. So first I thought I'd give you a bit of a comparison of populations. So EU, 447 million. Australia, we have 26 million people. And according to the internet, Czech Republic is 10.7. So when I show you a couple of these examples, you know, you might just need to do some math in your head on what it means for your particular country because I, I think the percentages are very similar. So when we think about inclusive design, uh, there's, a different, there's different scales in terms of ability. So if we think about my dad in this particular case, so if you're thinking about a permanent brain damage or a degenerative brain damage, that's classified as a permanent category. So for his type of dementia in Australia, there are between 700 and 2,300 cases. Pretty, pretty rare. So solving for him, you're not going to necessarily solve for a lot of people. But people aren't just permanently brain damaged. You can be temporarily impaired cognitively. And there's a couple of different ways that you can, you can do that. Um, so the first one, if we think about something like a stroke, uh, in Australia, there was just under 28,000 people that had a stroke for the first time in their lives in 2020, which equates to one every 19 minutes. Now, I don't have the next level stats to tell you if those people are recoverable, but a lot of people can recover from a stroke with rehabilitation. So they may be impaired for a short amount of time or they may be impaired forever. And during that time, a lot of the, a lot of the people using the stroke, you know, they have trouble concentrating, they may have trouble reading, they ha may have trouble with hand-eye coordination, etc. Also in the temporary category, we would have something like a concussion. So in Australia, about 3,000 concussions occur every year. So that can be from all sorts of things like auto accidents. It can be com quite commonly um, sporting injuries and stuff like that. Now that can temporarily impair you. So you might have to lay in a dark room for six months. You may have trouble concentrating. You may have trouble reading. You may suffer from a lot of headaches. These people are temporarily impaired on that scale. Then we get to situational, which is where you may be impaired for the moment, a minute, a week, a short period of time, but it's not every day. So how many people here, if you've been out at night, had a few, had a few drinks and you thought you might be in trouble from the police if you got in your car and drove home. How many people after they had a few drinks would get in the car and drive home? Couple? Okay, cool. <laughs> um, 
but the rest of you wouldn't. If you had woken up at 6 o'clock in the morning and now it was an 11 o'clock at night, how many people would think twice about getting in the car and driving home? A couple would, but most of us would still get in the car. So a person who's been awake for 17 hours straight is considered as cognitively impaired as someone who is legally drunk, which for Australia is 0.05, I think. It varies a bit in Europe. Some are zero, some are 0.05. I think some are even 0.08. But yeah, so 17 hours awake straight, you are drunk, apparently. Other common situational impairment is um, for, is new parents. So a, a new parent, on average, loses 109 minutes of sleep every night for the first year after a baby. And in Australia, uh, there were just under 300,000 registered births in 2020. So looking at the fact that they're losing that much sleep a night, that's a lot of people running around cognitively impaired every day for the first year of the, the newborn's life. Um, I don't have children, but uh, I'm a wildlife carer as well. Um, so if I have to night feed a baby possum, uh, which requires, you know, six hourly feeds, I, I definitely know that I'm impaired after the first few days. Like, my head is a mess. Um, so I definitely understand how this can be considered as cognitively impaired if you have a newborn and losing sleep every night. The other common one, um, anyone suffered from stress? Anyone? Yeah, yeah. So, again, another Australian statistic. 2021, one in five 16 to 34-year-olds 30, experienced high or very high levels of psychological distress. Um, if anyone's ever faced burnout, high stress, it can be quite impa impairing. So um, I had a, like a, a, an assessment recently and I thought I was fine. I was a little bit nervous. And the first thing they ask you to do is like on the iPad, you have to you know, fill out your details and your email address and started typing in. And I stuffed up my email address, which I've had forever, and trying to fix the spelling error. And my brain just, it just flaked. I could not, could not fix it. So in the end, what I did was I just deleted it and I started again and my fingers you know, did the talking and it just all worked. Um, so if you look at the, the spectrum between permanent, temporary and situational, what that means is if you can fix it for the person that is only 2,400 people, you also fix it all the way up to over six million people in the population. So when you're thinking about inclusive design, fixing for one, you can fix for many. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, I haven't, I haven't covered all the different combinations. I've just picked out a couple of statistics. Yeah, yeah, and permanent doesn't have to be a super small group either. Yeah. This example I've used small going up to big, but yeah, a permanent group can also be large. Thank you. So if we go back and think about some of the things that my dad had to do in his day to get onto that laptop, um, one of the first things was user access. Um, this whole section I kind of put into user access, why so hard? Uh, if you've looked at any of the user access stuff over the years, it's, it's really, like, I describe it just as a hot mess. Uh, there's lots of really horrible examples of people trying to be really tricky. So you've got a standard username and password. There's, you know, you get examples of sites. Instead of asking you just to enter that, they'll ask you for, please enter the fourth and eighth character of your password. Like, what? Or they'll ask you, instead of verifying your phone number, which you can just type because you've had it forever, they'll ask you for the last four digits. I don't know about anyone else, but if someone asks me the last four digits, I have to think about it as opposed to just entering the whole phone number. Uh, we've got things like you've one-time passwords, your 
authenticators, things that make you get off one device and onto another and break your concentration. So you're out of that default mode network. The number of times that I'm in and out of different Teams uh, sites every day, like, and the number of times I have to go and jump on my phone to press yes or the number, it adds up to a lot of time in the day and it really, and it breaks up your concentration over the day. And then things like proving, like ticking that you're not a robot. So rather than cover all of them, I mean, there's things we can do to get around them. So there's things like, you know, password managers that help you. We've got things like Ubi keys. You can use you know, Windows Hello, fingerprint readers, facial readers, etc. cetera. Um, I just wanted to touch on one example to give you a bit of an idea of how this affects people in, with different abilities. So I'm going to do a bit of an exercise, and we're going to create a Microsoft account. And I've got a few different evolutions of this for you. And we're going to look at this through the eyes of a couple of different users. And to do this, uh, I usually like to have a volunteer. Would anyone like to be a volunteer for me? No one? Yes, thank you. Would you like to come up, or do you want me to come down to you? You good to come up? Yeah? What's your name? Uh, my name is Yan. Hi, Yan. You want to come up on stage with me? So we're going to look at this through the eyes of a different user. So for the, for the moment, you're going to be Anna. No problem at no all. No problems? Yeah. So Anna, she is a 24-year-old pharmacist. She's from rural France. And she's come out to Australia recently uh, as a pharmacist. Now, in her rural village in France, they didn't. They, she, her English is okay, but everyone didn't really speak a lot of English there. So her English is passable, but not super fluent in Australia. So what her boss has asked her to do is he's asked her to fill out some paperwork. But to do that, she has to create a Microsoft account, and for whatever reason, the computer's locked down, and she can't change it. So it's in English. So this is the this is what I call the this is the September experience of creating a Microsoft account. So Anna, when you look at this, or I don't know if you want to look at that one instead, thinking about the fact that English is your not your first language, okay. yeah, um, and you, you want to just do something and get your work done. What, what comments would you make about this first screen? So, I guess I would see a big blue button that sort of uh, naturally uh, like asks me to be pressed because yep. there doesn't seem to be another obvious option. Of course, there is the tiny arrow back, which most probably leads me back, but I, that's not the way I want to go. Yeah. Um, and then as a person, how does, how does asking you to prove that you're not a robot, how does it make you feel? Weird. Weird, Absolutely. Right? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Like, it doesn't make you feel good about yourself. Yeah, like why, you know, I would even, like especially I'm Anna from rural, you know, area, uh, why PC needs to know that I'm not a computer or robot. Yeah. Okay, so then would you press the blue button? I guess as there is a no other option, I guess I would. Yes, okay, we'll go to the next one. So this is the next screen that you see. Now, have you got any comments on that one? Um, I have absolutely no idea what's going on there. Yeah, right? Yeah. Be hard to see. Um, yeah. Yeah, everyone I've shown this to cannot really see it. So we'll just zoom in a little bit. How about now? Uh, not better. Not better? Uh, I, yeah. I don't know if it's like because it's black and white or because of the pictograms or whatever yep. those things are. Um, most I, I'm supposed to find two identical objects. Yeah. Uh, and that expects, you know, me to sort of uh, understand what the sentence. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so to you, uh, what would identical to? objects mean? Um, I'm, I'm, oh, all right. I 
think I was looking at the background pictures. Yeah, right. But most probably what they expect me to compare are those pictograms, which maybe that's I'm damaged because I expected those to be sort of a covering the picture so robot can't see that. But I need to think as an Anna from rural country. So yeah. most probably I will be looking for, let's say, the the lock in a top right corner which is upside down, and I will be, like, scanning for, all right, is any other picture uh, same? Apparently, there's not. So, most probably, I will need to go, like, one by one yep. of each of those pictures and try to find that. Does it require to be there on the same picture? Yeah, pick one square. Again, you know, I am not understanding English. Apparently, I play my role well. So, most probably... After, you know, three minutes of discussion, I guess I will pick the middle one at the bottom. Yep, yep. And that one, to me, I don't know about Anna, but it doesn't look identical because it's been flipped. So to uh, me, it wasn't obvious at first. Yeah, and yeah. there is no button to continue, which even would be like grayed out or, yeah. you know, even after clicking the, the square. So you've clicked it. And then we get another one. Oh. And this tells you that you've got one of five of these to do. Okay. Um, and then... Okay, let's say I see the picture which contains two same pictograms, but to be truth be told, I don't. Yep. Um, so eventually you'll pick one, will you? Yes, So we'll pick probably. one? Let me get another one. Um, and we've right. got one right. I've already. Point. I'm already giving up. You've already given up, probably. Because you know, you know what happens now is once you've got one wrong, it becomes one of twenty. Okay. So did Anna give up? Most oh, sorry. Did Anna uh, give up? M most probably. Yeah. Did Anna feel good about herself? Not at all. No. And did Anna like feel like the computer understood her? And uh, no, no, because it thought that she's a computer as well. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much for your help. Give me a round of applause. So, yeah, this keeps going on for a while. And eventually it gives you an example like this. And it tells you that it gives you a little bit of instruction, but you had to have, get them, you had to have got them wrong for a while first. So my next example, uh, this is going to be Ting. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to pick on anyone anymore because um, we, we'll, uh, I, can, I can play all these different roles. So um, Ting, she is a 92-year-old retired shop owner. Uh, she's a grandmother of five and she would best describe herself as a digital immigrant because she didn't grow up with computers. She doesn't really like the computer. She uses it because she has to, because she likes to get on video chats with her grandkids. So the grandkids have just started at a new daycare centre and the daycare likes to share some photos about the kids. So they make her sign up for a Microsoft account to be able to see them. This is what I would call, this is the early October experience. So they did update it. Again, it's quite small and hard to read. So the first thing I usually do is zoom in. Um, they have changed it, so now it's no longer black and white. There's color there. Does anyone feel the color helps them rather than looking at the black and white image? A couple, yeah? I've had other feedback from people that the colors made it worse, uh, especially people that uh, were sort of red, green, color blind. In this instance, uh, they've, I think they've slightly improved it because the, uh, the iconography there, it doesn't change colour. So you're not looking at a black one and a white one. In this case, they're all white. Uh, they still do things like crop the images off the bottom. So Ting keeps on going. She's persistent. She really wants to see her kids' stuff. But she wears glasses, but she tends to not put them on. And she's got five pairs and has to dig them out of, out of the drawer. So by the time she puts them on and has a look, she gets to this point and she wasn't quite fast enough. So she has to start again at 105. Again, Ting is not feeling like this is making her feel good. 
Next example, someone a bit younger. So this is Mary. So she's a 34-year-old civil engineer. She loves to mountain bike. She loves to hit the trails. She fell off her mountain bike and hit her head pretty hard. And she, even though she was wearing a helmet, she suffered a concussion. So she's been at home recovering in a dark room. Now she can get to the point where she can get on the computer for a little bit before it gives her a bit of a headache. And she finds that if she's on there for a little bit long, it's quite tiring. But her friends have just gone on this amazing adventure race. And she wants to log on and check on their progress and make sure they're okay. So to do that, she's going to have to create a Microsoft account to get on. Now, this is what I call the Ignite Day experience. So this changed sort of the 13th, 14th of October. Uh, so this one, they've improved a little bit and somehow I just saved my presentation. Um, the wording is a bit different now. So now you have to pick the penguin. So there's a lot less text there now. There's, there's, do people think that's an improvement? Some, yeah. Uh, looking at those pictures, does any, can anyone pick the penguin really quickly? Most people? I kind of looked at it and went, I think they mean the one in the top right, but what type of penguin are we looking for? Like, is it meant to be an emperor penguin, a king penguin, a fairy penguin? Again, I zoomed in and had a little bit of a look. Um, again, to me, these almost look computer generated. Actually, the whole exercise feels like, to me, like a computer would actually do this better than a human. So I almost feel like they're wanting you to prove you're a robot. Eventually, again, if you get enough wrong, um, you'll get the whoops that wasn't quite right. And it gives you a bit, uh, I think a slightly improved example. I find, I found it with a few people, the contrast there, like peeking out from black and white image, they still have a lot of trouble, like working out which one the penguin's supposed to be. Uh, but I think this one, to me, is a lot better than trying to pick out the identical images uh, quickly. So that was Mary. She did persist and her friends were completely safe and really loved their trip. So, the final example I'm gonna show you, this is Bruce Willis. He's a 67 year old retired actor. He has aphasia. So that's very similar uh, to how my dad presented. So Bruce Willis, uh, he has trouble reading and comprehending text, so he, when he needs to create his Microsoft account for whatever he does today, now that he's retired, um, this is going to be too hard for him. He doesn't know what he's supposed to do. But somehow, down in that bottom little right-hand corner there, he found the accessibility button. So this one's an audio challenge. Um, I can't down, I, you can't download these ones anymore, otherwise I would have downloaded to show you. But what it does when you play it, it plays like a big lot of static and then there's people talking in the background and this one you have to pick out which of the different recordings uh, only one person is talking in. Any thoughts on how someone who can't read very well would handle the one that's meant to be better for accessibility? No, no good. Uh, so here he has to pick out where one person is talking. He has to answer it as a number and press enter or the done button. So he can't really work out what he's supposed to do. So he presses a few things. He types some stuff and says he has to enter a number. Um, pressing E was incorrect and he can enter only one number of your choice, e.g. one. Eventually he gives up and it sort of freezes and it, he, he, he just gives up in the end. So that option was not good for Bruce Willis. So not to pick on Microsoft, but like this one definitely failed all of those sort of, like it doesn't help them get to the point where they can communicate. They wanna create this account so that they can communicate and share and, and interact with other people. Definitely didn't feel good. Like I haven't taken anyone through this who makes, who makes them feel good like, I tried this with my mother, and as soon as she saw the one of 20, she said, I am never going to finish this. <laughs> Please take it away. And it definitely doesn't, you know, it isn't smart and knows what a person wants to do. So let's put that away for now. Um, 
Moving on to another section, a thing that a lot of things that my dad or a lot of us have to do is answer uh, questions on forms. And a lot of us have to take, e.g., a paper form or make up our own questionnaires and put them online. A lot of us haven't had training on how to do this properly and make it easy for people. Uh, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not saying I'm an expert, but I'm going to show you a couple of ones that I see a lot that really violate these principles of making people feel better. So the first one I call the double barrel question. Uh, so that's when we try and do a couple of things in one, one question to make our lives as devs easier, but doesn't help the users. So if we think about this through the eyes of Tim. So Tim is a 59-year-old truck driver. Uh, he's just been on a big long haul route and his boss has asked him to fill out an employee survey. This time he doesn't have to use a Microsoft account. So the question he has to answer, and these are real questions that I've taken from places I've been, um, how satisfied or dissatisfied are you with the pay and work benefits of your current job? Now Tim, he's pretty okay with his pay, like it's reasonable, but there's a few different work benefits there that you know, he'd like to bring up. He's not particularly satisfied with some of the work benefits. So if you had a one to five scale, what would Tim, what would be the right answer for Tim? Would he, had it, does he give it a five? Does he give it a one? Does he average them out to a three? Uh, if you had some text there for him to enter, because uh, he has a different response for different parts of the question, you're going to muddy the waters of your data. So when you try to analyze this later, you're going to have a lot of trouble working out the overall value of this question and, and track it through time because you're asking two different things. Uh, the easiest way to fix this, this particular type of one is to split it up into two separate questions. So then he can, even though it feels quite repetitive and they're quite similar, it allows you to get very specific data on the exact thing and he can be very clear about what he's answering. Then Tim feels a little bit better. To add on to something like a, a double barrel question, uh, the next one I want to, I see a lot is a mixed logic, what I call a mixed logic question. So we're going to look at this through the eyes of Sarah. So she's a 20 year old student. Her grandmother is in an aged care facility. Uh, up until recently, uh, to get into the aged care facility, you had to fill out a questionnaire and answer a few things and get them right uh, before they'd let you in the door. This is one of the questions that she would have to answer on the way in the original question. So have you had a COVID test in the last 72 hours? Was the result positive, yes, no? Who thinks the right answer if she had had a test in this last 72 hours and she had a negative result? Who thinks the right answer is yes? One. Who thinks the right answer is no? Interesting. Who knows? But the answer was actually, uh, the, the correct answer to, on this form was no, uh, which is interesting. The receptionist at the nursing home, you know, she was getting really frustrated because everyone was getting frustrated at her because they would get the question wrong. Uh, most people, like when you went through it with them, uh, they would say, have I had a COVID test in the last 72 hours? Yes. And then that, because they're like, the first part of the end and then off they go. But no, it was a really badly worded question. Treat pretty much everyone up, especially when you're in a hurry, you're answering these 50 questions, you want to get in the door. So they, after a lot of feedback, they did actually revise this question. So the second question, second version of this question, have you had a COVID test in the last 72 hours and was the result negative? Slight improvement. Yeah, a bit more obvious that if you'd done the two things that you've got the right answer. This one definitely proved to be a lot better for them. They weren't getting as upset. This third one, 
was the, the, last, the last version of it that they had. So have you had a negative COVID test result in the last 72 hours? Now this one is nice and succinct. And I think uh, in general, at the time, because we'd had, we'd had this going on for a while now, most people at this time were a bit more experienced. So they knew what a COVID test was. They, and they knew what a negative COVID test was. So this one was a little bit more succinct and worked well with what I would call experienced users. If somehow you'd managed not to have to have one of these before, it still was tripping people up. But do people think they would find this one easier than the first two? Yeah, cool. Then the third set of... Uh, the third example of questions is what I call evidential questions. So this is where we have a form. We ask people a bunch of stuff about themselves and we ask them to provide evidence. So we ask them to upload something like an insurance certificate, for example. So the example here I'm gonna use is Leslie. So Leslie is a 37 year old accountant. She's a mother of one. But Leslie has had a really tough year. So Leslie's had leukemia. And so she has had to go to a private hospital uh, and undergo a bunch of chemo, a bunch of blood tests, and spend a whole lot of time trying to get better. In Australia, uh, we have a public system and a private system. Uh, Leslie, because she, you know, she's fortunate, she can afford the, pub, the private system, which gives her a private room. Uh, when we have that, what it means is that everything that is normally free, you have to pay for and then claim it back. So Leslie uh, daily has to, have, has, has to have a blood test to check a bunch of her levels. So after the whole year of being, uh, having blood tests, going into hospital, coming out, she ends up with like a big pile of receipts this big and she has to try to claim them back through our government system and also her private health system. So this is a typical, this is a, this is a government website in Australia. So the, the first one, it's got some text, it kind of makes sense. Everyone sort of just presses the start button. The second question, this, do you have this document about statement of claim and benefit? Pretty much everyone I know just guesses yes or no and if it doesn't work, they go back and press the other one. So we work that one out eventually. Uh, the second one, you have, a met, you have a card, you enter your details, all good. You enter a couple of questions like, have you paid for it? Do you have a receipt? Then you have to upload your documents. So she's gone and uploaded her receipts. Then each one of those receipts has some details that they want to know. So you have to go in and enter those things about it. So this is an example. I've blacked out the details because it's obviously pro very personal private health insurance um, information. Uh, the stuff in red is the stuff that they ask for. So they ask for things like what date of the service was it, the provider number, which is like the doctor's like registered number, um, the item code, because we have a code for everything that you have done, and then how much did it cost you. But the form asks them to enter all this information. Um, so for Leslie, she's got this big wad of receipts. After a year, if you, she's put it into an Excel spreadsheet, it's 600 lines. With this form, you can only enter five at a time. So the data entry for her takes a really long time and it goes round and round in circles and some get rejected. And to me, this just seems really, really bad because you've just gone through one of the worst things in your life and now you have to enter all this stuff in your time, in your spare time and trying to keep track of it. The simple, obvious thing to me would be, why do we not read these forms and pre-fill out any data that we can tell for her and then she just has to enter the additional stuff or fix some of the stuff up. And for the life of me, I do not understand why they limit it to five at a time. When a receipt like this, um, this receipt there is seven pages of item codes. So she had to keep track of where she was up to. So this one for her, you know, it definitely, it didn't help her communicate, definitely didn't make her feel good. And it definitely failed the making a user feel better about themselves. So, 
Yeah, so if you don't, yeah, if you don't put anything in, then they don't have to pay you. Yeah. But in the end, someone then still has to process all those claims. So when I thought back through all these principles, um, there's a few, like, people try to do this well, but I think there's a lot we can learn from games. And when I pulled this down a bit more, I could almost do a whole other talk on, like, game mechanics and how we can learn from some of the game mechanics. But if we look back at some of those principles, like, helping me connect with people, games, like, that's what they're really good at, right? People have been using games to connect with each other, express themselves, have avatars, have different ways to show their different creativity for a long time. Help me feel good about myself. Games do this well, right? Like, ha like if you've ever gone down a little rabbit hole of a game, like you've got achievements, you've got trophies, you've got farming, you've got all sorts of things that keep you coming back for more and that sense of accomplishment. Games do this really, really well. Be personal and smart and understand me. This has happened more recently. Obviously, we're going into like computer, like computer games as opposed to like board games. But the AI in these things now is pretty amazing, right? So like, you can have driver profiles and you're playing against your friends when they're not actually online and it drives or plays the game like it was them. And it, and it learns, like they have, a lot of, they have a lot of data about you and they use it really, really well. So then when you think about the default mode network as well, like games utilize this. So when you're sitting there and you're farming away and you're doing something repetitively and you're not thinking about it and you're burning time using your default mode network, they use lots of patterns and a lot of standards. So when you come across um, a shiny object across different games, you know that you want to go there and do something with it. You, de you know instinctively by the way they design the characters, the goodies from the baddies. And then they know when to switch that off and when to engage your, engage your brain on something that they need you to do. So if you're on a particular part of a mission, then you have to be a lot more concentrated, but it allows you to use that application for a really long time without completely burning out. But what I see here is the opportunity, how we can think about that with our own systems. How many of us do a lot of logging on our, on our applications? A few. So how many of us would know that a user had tried to enter data into the form 10 times and failed? A couple. Do, and does anyone do anything with that information? Like, do you use it to improve the form? No. Do you use it to notice that the person had failed 10 times and give them a different experience, give them different help. Like in a game, you might have a character come up to you and give you a bit of a hint of what you're supposed to do next. No? How many of us give our users different levels of access? So if I'm a beginner user versus an advanced user, do you provide a different UI? For, the, for, the not, for someone that wants to do a lot of data entry, that only use it once, once in a blue moon, do you provide a way for them to bulk upload data? Do you provide an API? Or have you noticed that at three o'clock in the afternoon, everyone gets a little bit tired and makes a few, mi few more mistakes? And does your UI adapt at that point in time and work out that maybe you need a different interface at that hour of the day? Different prompts, different way to notify people? This is the opportunity I think we have as developers to help build better systems. Because if we can allow people different ways to interact based on the way that we know that they're, that they're interacting with the system on different days, their, their abilities, because we log all, most of us will log this information and, and if we decided to use it, we could. Um, a lot of us, are, like a few systems will let us have different you know, profiles and pictures um, some of us will allow different color schemes, but how many of them will let you do a completely different layout? So for someone like Bruce Willis, for example, who has aphasia, 
you could allow him to have different iconography that is more receptive to the way his brain works. So instead of having a phone with a phone number there, you could replace it for him with something like a phone image that is uh, conducive to, the, to what he associates with the phone. So for someone young, it might be a mobile phone. For someone older, it might be the old like dial rotary phone. So what I would like you to take away from today is when, when you're building your systems is to think about the different users and how they would use them at different times of the day and the different experience levels that they have and how you can make your systems better and make them feel better about themselves. Because if they do that, they're going to come back and use it more often. You want to help them connect with people. We are social beings. You want to feel good about yourselves. No one wants to end the day at work feeling like they're useless or silly. The better your system is, the more work they're going to do and the better they're going to feel about themselves and the better they're going to feel about their jobs. And we want it to be personal and smart enough. We have the information like, to use it to help people do their job in a better way. Think about your outliers. Think about your more challenged users and how if you can solve a problem for them and make it easier for them, that you actually help make the system better for all of your users. That's about all I have. I did have a couple of references uh, later if you did want to have a look at things like if you enter the history of number pads and how some of those keyboard layouts come about. There's a few interesting articles there about all the different things that they tried. Uh, things like the number pad having the zeros down the bottom when cash, like, because it was like a cash register system when things were whole dollars, whereas now things tend to be like, I'm not sure about here, but other places tend to be like $1.99. Uh, there's the link for Microsoft Inclusive Design Principles and a few art an article about the sleep deprivation and how, how you can verse that against alcohol intake, if you're interested. And then, did anyone have any questions before we finish? Online, but uh, if you want to ask questions or maybe if you want to share any experiences with uh, really, really well done uh, UI or really poorly done AI, you can share. share. And I have a question. Yeah. Uh, do you have some uh, UI that was uh, that you were really satisfied with that you, you encountered that was really, uh, really well done? either in Microsoft or? Um, I think they all have, I mean, I think everything can be better. Um, I think something like, well, I can bag it as well as praise it, but I think something like Microsoft Azure can be quite good. So it, I think it does well in that it allows people to interact in different ways. So it allows you to do like your click ops, or it allows you to have an API, it allows you to interact with different ways. Definitely some of the layouts and stuff need a lot of work. Uh, there's a bunch of the different, um, like your, a lot of this, there's a few systems that have some good onboarding. So like uh, anything that allows you to sort of tick off the steps and gives you a bit of a progress bar and like very clear of where you're up to. And I think a lot of those, I'm trying to think of one off the top of my head, but a lot of those will again, like take from some of those game mechanics. Um, i trying to think of another one that has, is, um, nothing I've used recently like really stood out. Did anyone have any that anyone else can think of that like had a good interface to onboard? Yeah? So, yeah. so I don't have a question but I could think of a good example for a good user experience. Like the most basic one is some logging form and you can take out the most annoying ones, like li really annoying is when you type in some password and you fill out some uh, input fields uh, like name, age, other stuff and you type, you type uh, register or login or something like that and it gives you some error at the end and clears, clears your password and then you have to type in something again and clears it and you 
and you do that for about 10 times. But uh, for me, on the other hand, what a good uh, login or register form experience is, like uh, on the side, you have uh, something of an, uh, like a progress, like uh, something, some text with some errors uh, to them. And when you type the password, it ticks off. Like you type uh, uh, big letter and small letter and it ticks off and then you write the symbol and it ticks off again and shows you uh, some progress. And when you have everything ticked off, you just click on reg register and then you can go, but you're not coming back like 10 times. Yeah. I think yeah. that that's some good user experience yeah. for me. That's a good example. Yeah. Thank you. I think I'm out of time. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Oh, that's Thank you, everyone. Thank you to our great speaker. And we will see you on the next panel. Thank you very much, everyone. <laughs>